Hello, welcome to Disposable Bronchoscopy in Airway and Ventilation Management presented by TSC Life. I am Nicole Bennett. I am the U.S. Clinical Specialist for TSC Life, and I've been a respiratory therapist for over 25 years, both at the bedside and in a commercial setting. And this is uh, my partner, Jaap Bakker. Go ahead, Jaap. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Jan Bakker. I am a nurse anesthetist by training with over 10 years of clinical practice, and I'm a clinical specialist for bronchoplex. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges of ventilation during bronchoscopy, particularly in patients that are intubated. So maintaining adequate ventilation during bronchoscopy in intubated patients can be challenging due to several factors, primarily impacting airway mechanics and gas exchange. So the main hurdles are airway obstruction, due to the bronchoscope itself, or mucosal irritation, or other procedure-related changes. Air trapping, because the bronchoscope can trap oxygen-poor exhaled gases in the alveoli, while oxygen-rich gases from the ventilator cannot effectively reach uh, those areas. And this air trapping can also result in increased levels of auto beep or high plateau pressure, that we will talk about a little bit more about later. And then lastly, the impaired gas exchange due to diffusion limitations or reduced lung compliance or the hemodynamic effects of bronchoscopy. So, Nicole, when we talk about bronchoscopy in intubated patients, why shouldn't we just choose large endotracheal tubes to accommodate the bronchoscope? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Yap. So, choosing the right endotracheal tube size is crucial for optimizing ventilation and for minimizing complications in intubated patients. Reflexively intubating patients with large endotracheal tubes really should be avoided. And some things to consider uh, are things like friction and pressure. Not surprisingly, larger endotracheal tubes exert greater friction and pressure against the mucous membranes of the trachea and the vocal cords. This increases the risk of mucosal erosions, ulcerations, vocal cord damage, such as paralysis or intubation granulomas scar tissue formation, and tracheal stenosis. These complications can then lead to the patient experiencing discomfort, bleeding, voice changes, persistent coughing, and breathing complications. While it's perfectly normal to experience some hoarseness post-extubation, hoarseness persisting longer than seven to 10 days is a sign that there may be some laryngeal granulomas in there. We need to take a further look. Tracheal stenosis is also something that can occur in later weeks, sometimes even months after the intubation. So some things to consider are the patient anatomy, the size of the patient, the height of the patient, underlying airway conditions, endotracheal tube uh, material, and the design. So it's important to remember that damage to the airways can occur with an endotracheal tube in place for as little as one to two hours. So with all things considered, the best way to minimize injury risk is to choose the smallest endotracheal tube suitable to ventilate and using size charts and formulas. So we have a case study here. This is a gentleman who underwent an emergent intubation during cardiac arrest. He was intubated for about eight days with an 8O endotracheal tube, which is pretty typical. 66 year old gentleman, 69 inches tall, and uh, he is experiencing um, vocal cord um, hoarseness and voice changes over 90 days after the event. Some of the reasons for this are what we previously mentioned. So how can we avoid this? Well, in several studies have been published in recent years um, done by prominent ENT professionals showing that the use of 8O endotracheal tubes and larger really should be reserved for persons over six feet tall due to the long lasting and sometimes permanent airway damage that negates the perceived positive effects. There are international protocols being developed in partnership with the North American Airway Initiative and this encourages the use of height-based guidelines for intubation. Yop will further explain how large endotracheal tubes may not be helpful, especially in cases with low lung compliance, such as ARDS. All right, thank you very much. So bronchos bronchoscopy is obviously a valuable diagnostic and therapy procedure, but the insertion of a bronchoscope into the airway can significantly impact ventilation, 
particularly when the airway is accessed through an endotracheal tube. Um, the bronchoscope increases the resistance to airplane or airflow during the inhalation, the, but obviously also, or even more so during the outflow. So higher airway resistance requires increased driving pressures from the ventilator to achieve the same tidal volume, and that can impact ventilation efficiency. Larger bronchoscope diameters lead to higher pressures needed to maintain the desired tidal volume, and that can increase the risk of borrow trauma and hemodynamic compromise. So the reduced airway diameter can limit the volume of air delivered during inspiration, even with increased driving pressures. Uh, that can lead to hypoxemia or hypercarbia. And during bronchoscopy, the incomplete exhalation due to increased airway resistance can trap air in the lungs, creating intrinsic positive and expiratory pressure or autopeep. And that further increases the risk of barotrauma and circulatory changes. So unfortunately, there's no universally accepted reference tables or formulas for selecting the appropriate bronchoscope diameter based solely on the endotracheal tube size. That's because choosing the ideal bronchoscope diameter factors in several additional variables uh, beyond the, just the tube size, such as the procedure requirements. So smaller bronchoscopes obviously have the advantage of, of reduced airway obstruction that minimizes the airway resistance and are potentially suitable for smaller endotracheal tubes, minimizing laryngeal injury. But they may, however, restrict the use of certain instruments or reduce the suction capabilities uh, due to the smaller working channel. Large bronchoscopes offer larger working channels with enhanced suction capability, but they increase the airway obstruction uh, in smaller airways and the compatibility with smaller endotracheal tubes. So finding the perfect fit should always be guided by the principle of least invasive approach. Using the smallest scope possible that still provides adequate visualization, but creates minimal airway disruption and allows for therapeutic interventions that improve the patient outcomes. So while there's no universally accepted reference tables, we do now have some studies that have looked at this particular su uh, subject. So a new study from, uh, that was published by a team from Columbia University in New York highlights the importance of carefully considering endotracheal tube size and bronchoscope diameter during bronchoscopy to minimize airway obstruction, but optimize ventilation and ensure patient safety. So the recommendations based on this study include that we should always minimize endotracheal tube size, Based on the findings, the authors recommend using the smallest endotracheal tube possible that allows for adequate ventilation and bronchoscope passage to minimize the risk of laryngeal injury from larger tubes. So consider smaller bronchoscopes for procedures where feasible smaller bronchoscopes could uh, be used even with smaller endotracheal tubes to further reduce the airway obstruction. Always monitor the airway pressure and keep a low inspiration time to allow for sufficient time for the exhalation to minimize auto peep and high plateau pressure levels. So overall, the study um, showed that seven or seven and a half endotracheal tubes still allow for safe bronchoscopy with standard or regular sized bronchoscopes. Larger bronchoscopes, however, are only usable in eight millimeter endotracheal tubes, but these should be avoided to mitigate the risk of injury. So there exists a paradox between choosing a small enough scope that allows for safe bronchoscopy in seven or seven and a half millimeter endotracheal tubes and selecting a device that allows for sufficient suction and a big enough working channel. Broncoflex is a single use flexible bronchoscope that resolves that paradox of the ratio between the inner and the outer diameter because it has a large 2.8 millimeter working channel but concealed in a standard or medium sized 5.6 millimeter outer diameter. So it's an excellent choice for adult ICU bronchoscopy procedures and advanced bronchoscopy procedures. Nicole, would you like to talk about this new study? Yes, thanks, Yeah. So uh, this study done by Dr. Reddy and Benjamin Heck from the University of Utah Health Sciences Center will be presented this May at the 2024 ATS International Conference in San Diego, California. As you can see from the chart, the Broncoflex Vortex provides maximum suction capability when compared to the other scopes tested, and it appears to even actually excel in high viscosity scenarios. It should be noted that during this study, only regular sized bronchoscopes were tested in order to align with the recommendations presented in the Kalabayev study previously mentioned by Yaw. So regular size scopes are between five and 5.6 outer diameter, 
and they all fit into size seven or less endotracheal tubes. Uh, so bronchoflex, everything you need, nothing you don't. As you can see here, uh, bronchoflex is an excellent choice for routine bedside procedures, such as BALs, bronchial washouts, perk trachs, and single lung ventilation in the OR, but it has also been given high satisfaction scores when used in advanced bronchoscopy procedures, such as needle biopsy, valve or stent placement, cryotherapy, and ablation. Yop, do you mind talking a little bit more about this? Yes, thank you very much. So a bench of comparison of single-use bronchoscopes was published in the Journal of Intensive Care Medicine last year. That same research was already presented at the European Respiratory Society as a poster, and it assessed the clinical preference of healthcare professionals between five commercially available single-use flexible bronchoscopes. And the results show a preference for bronchoflex by the majority of healthcare providers assessed over all commercially available single-use bronchoscopes. And another publication in Respiration uh, had already concluded that bronchoflex scores very high satisfaction scores in both routine and advanced procedures. So monitoring and preventing respiratory compromise during bronchoscopy in intubated and ventilated patients is crucial for ensuring patient safety and successful procedure outcomes. Some key strategies are optimizing oxygenation, continuously monitoring mon vital signs and airway pressures. If you note higher pressures, maybe shorten the eye time. Uh, minimizing bronchoscopy procedure time by choosing the smallest bronchoscope capable of providing the visualization and airway access needed, while also minimizing airway obstruction. Yop, is there anything else you want to add? Just that bronchoflex may be quite new in the US, but we're absolutely not new at, at this. We've been making single-use bronchoscopes for a long time. So bronchoflex is made in Europe in our manufacturing facilities here in Tours, France, offering an intuitive, low-waste and sterile solution with minimal carbon footprint. And lastly, we are very proud to announce the merger of our patient temperature management and endovision companies into the creation of TSC Life that fuses together the natural synergies of these companies. And the results allow us to innovate like never before, crafting products that deliver the best possible patient outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you.